Hi everyone, welcome back to Planet Linux. Today we're going to be taking a look at Vanilla OS. This has come up a lot in my recommended feeds of something that's <laughs> relatively popular these days. Everyone seems to be taking an interest in it, and I can certainly understand why. Vanilla OS is an immutable Linux distribution that aims to provide stability and security uh, to a higher degree than you normally see. And it achieves this by installing applications into containers and using a multi-root system for updates, which allows it to essentially test updates in a sandbox before it applies them to your core system. This makes sure that the core parts of the operating system aren't messed up or corrupted in any way. But beyond that, it's essentially an Ubuntu-based distro that uh, aims to provide a very vanilla GNOME experience, but have all the utilities you need in order to do just about anything you'd want to on Linux. So I will just jump right in looking at it, and the first thing I want to mention is actually the installation experience. I had some footage of this, but I seem to have lost it. <laughs> so we'll be going off of their documentation screenshots here for the installer. Uh, this uses a customized installer that I've not seen before. I believe it's their own custom utility, but I can't be 100% certain. Regardless, it's an incredibly clean looking installer. Uh, it has just about all the features you'd need, and it looks really good. Uh, I honestly think more distros should be using this. It's really clean and straightforward to walk through, gives you all the options you could need. It's a really nice install experience. Also, after installation, though, it, it runs through a first-time setup that allows you to really customize your experience. It'll let you pick things like choosing your light or dark theme, but then you can also choose which package formats you want to add support for. The benefit of this distribution using containers for packages is that it can not only run Ubuntu applications like deb files as it's based off of, as well as flat packs or app images, but it can also run applications designed for other distros such as RPMs, which you'd use on Fedora or OpenSUSE, or even packages from the Arch user repository. So you can set up that support during this first setup here. You can also pick which applications you'd like to be installed by default. Uh, you can choose from a selection of core applications, whether you want an office suite and certain system utilities. Uh, you can either choose those in bulk or uh, fine tune exactly which ones you want installed. You can choose to install restricted media codecs. If you have an NVIDIA graphics card, it'll also prompt if you wish to install NVIDIA drivers and Likewise, if you're using a virtual machine, it will recognize that and prompt you to install additional tools to help with virtual machine's performance. So honestly, it's just a really clean both installation and initial setup that not only makes it really easy to walk through, but also really lets you customize the experience. So first off, on the surface, this really is a standard vanilla GNOME experience. It's everything you'd come to expect from GNOME. If you enjoy using distributions that use a stock GNOME experience like Fedora, then you'll be right at home here because that is essentially what this offers. And on the surface, vanilla OS really does work just like any other standard distribution running GNOME. And I guess that's kind of the point. But as you dig a little deeper, you see that there are not only a lot of niceties that it adds in here to make the experience better, but of course a lot of those underlying under the hood things that theoretically will make vanilla OS a much more robust distribution. So first off, while it is a very stock GNOME experience out of the box, it does come included with the extension manager application. And unlike the standard GNOME extensions app, which just lets you browse extensions like you can here, the extension manager also lets you install extensions from the web right here in the app. And that may sound rather trivial, but it really is a much better experience to be able to browse for all those GNOME customizations and extensions without having to go to the GNOME extensions website, install a browser add-on in order to be able to download and then install extensions. It just makes it much easier to browse them all here in this single application. So while it's clear that the Vanilla OS team really does want to keep the stock GNOME experience at the forefront of what they offer, they clearly recognize that it's important to make it easy to customize it to how an individual user wants it. I've installed a couple extensions here, but there are quite a few included out of the box, as you can see, for you to tweak your user experience. Otherwise, most of your installed apps out of the box here are a pretty standard affair for GNOME. 
Uh, of course, we also include the LibreOffice suite, your various standard system utilities. But as we chose during the post-installation setup, we also in installed a few extras here, like Lutris. Another application of note is the Vanilla Control Center. And this is a nice, again, nice little graphical utility here to control some of the specific features that Vanilla OS offers. This mainly revolves around which types of applications, other than standard Ubuntu packages, you want to be able to install. And this is essentially enabling containers for each of these types of distributions. So we have ones for Fedora here, which will allow us to run RPM packages. We can also have an Arch container that allows the installation of packages from the Arch user repository. Of course, there's a standard Ubuntu one for installing your typical Ubuntu dev packages. And this utility lets you manage the applications installed in each of these containers. We also have a few settings here on this first tab for managing how often it will check for updates across the various uh, repositories and package types. And that leads me into the good old terminal and the back end of some of the features here in Vanilla OS. While this is based on Ubuntu, it has its own package manager called APX which manages this whole multiple root system and installing these various different types of packages. So you'll be using APX instead of apt when you go to manage your packages from the command line. Fortunately, it is really simple to use if you're familiar with apt. First off, you won't be using sudo with these commands because it manages all the root stuff on its end, where it uh, installs packages to the secondary sandbox route to test everything out, to test any updates uh, before it applies them to the main root system that you're using. So you won't be using root for APX, but otherwise the commands are largely the same. In fact, if we look up APX help here, we'll see that the commands it has are pretty much identical to apt, such as auto remove, clean, install, which is of course what you use to install a package, uh, Update will uh, update the database. Upgrade will upgrade any packages that you have installed. The commands are essentially the same as apt, so you'll feel right at home with using this. For example, apx update will check the database just as apt would. And it says all packages are up to date, but you could run apx upgrades to update anything that needs to be. Also, you'll notice if you want to specify a, ta a package from a particular repository, whether that be Ubuntu's, uh, which uses apt, Fedora's, using DNF, or the Arch user repository, or the AUR, uh, you can specify that with a flag here. So for example, if you do apx install dash dash AUR Spotify, it's going to look for Spotify in the Arch user repository. And the first time I'm doing this here, it's actually creating the Arch container because I had no need for it before. It doesn't need to take up any space, but now that I want to install an Arch package, uh, it's going to create that so that it can do this. I presume this will take a couple moments here, being that it's the first time. But then it should go out and look for the Spotify package in the AUR. I don't actually know if it's there, but we'll see. Yep, and as we can see, now it has downloaded the application and it is currently building it in the typical fashion from the AUR. No, actually, rather, it's asking me to confirm what I want to build, I believe. And I'll proceed with this install. There, now it's building our package. And now go figure, it actually doesn't want to <laughs> doesn't want to properly build Spotify here. So I'll have to figure that out. I believe that's on Spotify's end, not the package manager here. That is the syntax for doing that. So Spotify's being Spotify there, but I'll try it with the Fedora package by doing apx install uh, with the DNF flag for Fedora's package manager. And then we'll try Lutris here. Uh, now Lutris is already installed as a standard Ubuntu package here. But we'll see how it differs, having multiple versions. Being the first time that we're doing it, it had to create the container again. And now it's running uh, the installation. As you can see here, it's the standard Fedora DNF uh, package manager here. And we'll let this do its thing. And now that that's completed, if we go into our applications here, of course we have our original Lutris package. Now we have the second one that indicates it's installed through the DNF container here. So we can see the difference there. Uh, obviously we don't need two versions of Lutris, it's just to show that it can. Uh, also within our vanilla control center, of course, we can see a list of our installed applications and manage them from here 
uh, based on the different containers that they're a part of. Now, as we chose to install Flatpak and AppImage support during the initial installation, we of course also have Flatpak in here. Uh, we can run any of our Flatpak commands to install Flatpaks. And in fact, the CIDR application that I have here, which is an Apple Music client, was installed from Flatpak. It works great, as you would expect. And app images do as well. Uh, there's even an app image utility that allows you to manage app images that are installed and make sure that they show up properly in the applications menu. So honestly, just the fact that you essentially have a stable Ubuntu-based distribution here, but with the flexibility of being able to install packages from just about any source that you'd want to. Uh, really the only thing that isn't here right now is snap package support, but that is promised to be on the way soon. But the fact that you're not just limited to the Ubuntu repos and flat packs or app images, but also anything that might be in the Arch user repository or an RPM file or something from uh, the Fedora repos, is really powerful here and really breaks down any of those barriers that we have in terms of uh, complications and limitations of various Linux package formats and with some applications only being available for certain formats but not others. Uh, you really don't have to worry about that here with vanilla OS just because you can install pretty much any of them. Now I will concede that regarding packages, the one issue I have noticed is in the Graphical Software Center. It's got the standard GNOME software utility here, uh, and it works pretty well, uh, as you'd expect. However, it seems that it only shows flat packs in here, uh, any packages from FlatHub for some reason. I would have expected it to at least include things from uh, the standard Ubuntu repos as well, but it does not seem to. So in terms of using the graphical Software Center, it seems pretty limited to FlatHub at this point, with no uh, clear way of enabling it to show additional repositories. All I really have here are automatic update settings. Uh, so that is kind of a glaring issue at this point. Uh, it would be great if you could search in here and it would just search for those packages across all of the various repositories that it supports. Now that being Ubuntu, Fedora, the AUR, and of course FlatHub as it already does here. Uh, so there's a lot of packages that you'll look for in here, and they just won't show up. But then if you use apx in the command line and search for it, it'll be there, and you can install it through the command line. So it's a bit of a problem at this point, and something that I do think needs to be resolved if they want this to catch on as a, uh, really as a distribution for anybody to use, which I would love to see, because having a distribution that essentially handles all the different package formats behind the scenes without users having to worry about uh, is this package a deb or an RPM or a flat pack and they, they can just use any Linux package out there is really a great concept and something I'd love to see but at this point when you can't install most of those applications graphically uh, it's definitely a bit limited at this point so that is something that definitely needs to be ironed out. That said, I am confident that there will be regular continual improvements to vanilla OS here. Uh, right now this is version 22.10, which is of course based on Ubuntu 22.10. Uh, this came out a couple months after that base version of Ubuntu did, so it's reasonable to think that in the next couple of months we'll probably see an updated 2304 release. Uh, and also, unlike a lot of distributions that don't have a lot of people actively developing them, which credit where credit's due, you know, when one or two people can come along and make a distribution that works really well, that's fantastic, it's amazing. But there is always the concern about continued future development. You know, if the distribution you're going to put on your computer is going to be actively maintained six months or a year or five years from then, uh, and fortunately, Vanilla OS has a dedicated and it seems growing team uh, behind it here. They have a good number of people actively involved right now. And this is just the people on their core team. Obviously, there are tons of community contributors behind this as well. But, you know, it's definitely a very active development effort with a lot of people truly dedicated to working on this distribution. So I do expect improvements to be frequent and significant. And, of course, right after I finished recording all the footage for this video, uh, there's a notice on their website announcing some initial work on Vanilla OS 2.0. Now there are some big changes to this, and excuse any discrepancy for the rest of the video, because 
this wasn't here yet, but the next main version of vanilla will be based on Debian instead of Ubuntu. Uh, they cite it just being easier to update and maintain the experience that they're looking to provide. It's a simpler base to work with that allows them to release vanilla OS updates more on their own schedule instead of being tied to specific Ubuntu releases. It's just easier for them to work with on the back end and it provides a more sort of rock solid and stable base. Uh, they also mentioned that this next version will include improvements to uh, the updating system as well as containerized applications and how well they run, and it will of course feature GNOME 44 and all of the new changes that come with that. Now that's just some initial bulletins they've mentioned about it, I'm sure there will be more to come in the future, but it just goes along to show that there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes here. It's in continual development, and this is a distro that doesn't look like it's going to be going away anytime soon. It's, it's here to stay, and it's only getting better over time. So, you know, Vanilla OS, while it may not quite be to the point where I would recommend anyone with you know, no prior Linux knowledge jump in as a first distribution, because there, frankly, is still some command line work you have to do. You know, if you want to install a lot of those packages, you are going to have to do most of it from the terminal here with APX, unless you're going to install flat packs, in which case the software center works great. Overall, though, everything else about this feels super polished, and it's super stable. It's a great experience. I haven't had any issues with it. You know, running applications from these different repos works great. Even running in containers like this, where I thought there may be issues with software working together and working as expected with different dependencies, it, it really doesn't have any issues. Everything just works great, other than Lutra's taking forever to start here for the first time. So honestly, I highly recommend giving Linux a try, even if it's just to experience the flexibility of being able to run really any Linux application you want, regardless of the package format that it's in. Otherwise, it's a fantastic GNOME experience, it's a fantastic Ubuntu-based experience. Of course, it comes with that very customizable installation, uh, being able to install uh, just the types of packages you want through that post-installation experience, it has the great custom installer. Honestly, it's just a fantastic all-around distribution. It's a great experience now if you're willing to you know, work with packages in the command line, and it's only going to continue to become a better and better experience for more and more users going forward. So I highly recommend giving it a try. So before this video wraps up, I do want to address something, the fact that once we hit a thousand subscribers a while back, which thank you to every one of you, I promised a Q&A video that would cover any of your guys' questions about Linux. And while I'm still happy to do that, I certainly got a more diverse set of questions than I had expected to. So what I think I want to do instead is address one or two questions at the end of each video for the next little while in order to get through some of them uh, in a bit more regular schedule, because I think that looking through everyone's comments and questions, dedicating a single video to it might become uh, rather lengthy and more than a lot of people would want to sit through. So I'm going to address one or two questions at a time here, and for today's video, I'm going to answer a question from Super Tortoise, asking for my thoughts on client-side versus server-side window decorations. And at least as I think I understand what he's asking, is whether I prefer the window decorations that being like the close, minimize, maximize buttons to be determined by the desktop itself, the display server and the desktop environment, or by an individual application. Uh, and honestly, that's a bit of a tricky one because as for example with GNOME here, uh, any server side decorations or those handled by the desktop are what you tend to see here in the top bar. In the case of GNOME, it only has a close button by default. Of course, you can add the others to it, but the benefit of having server-side decorations is they're standard across most of your applications. You know, any application here that uses the standard desktop controls is going to be unified in that. Whereas, oh by the way, this is the Ubuntu version of Lutris now. Bet you couldn't even tell the difference, could you? Uh -huh. Whereas, client-side or app-side decorations, such as this CIDR application, choose to have their own decorations here, which do fit in with the theming of the app itself rather well, but they don't really fit with the rest of the system. He points out that KDE uses a sort of hybrid approach, and I'm personally in favor of that, where the app can have a say regarding its theming if it wants to override standard controls, uh, make them look different, fitting with the app a little better, it can do that. 
but you can also set some base settings for what the window manager needs to have for controls. So if an app doesn't have a particular control, then that can be overridden to include it with a hybrid approach. Now that's not something that GNOME here uses, you either have the standard window manager controls or app specific ones. Um, but I do think a sort of hybrid approach is probably a good idea. If I had to pick one or the other though, I'd honestly say leave it as it is now with the ability to have app side decorations because frankly most apps are going to use the standard system theming here and thus will use the standard display servers decorations. I don't think every app should need to draw their own decorations. I think the server should have them, but if an app wants to, then by all means, I, I think it's fine because it does fit in with the overall theming of the app. This would look kind of weird if there was just a random title bar above this with a separate GNOME window control for closing the app. So I don't hate how things are now. Does anyone like my music preferences? Probably not. That's kind of where I stand on that. I know that's sort of a wishy-washy answer, but yeah, those are my thoughts. So a thank you to Super Tortoise. I'll be answering more questions in follow-up videos. And again, I thank every one of you for supporting this content. Uh, if you did enjoy this video, a like is greatly appreciated. If there's anything you'd like to let me know or ask about, feel free to post it in the comments. And if you haven't subscribed already, then that would be greatly appreciated. And I make sure that you stay notified of all the latest content. So thank you for watching, and I look forward to seeing you next time on Planet Linux.